Now in its 10th year, this is GabNet. Talk like you've never heard it before. Live from Harlem in New York City, it's me, I'm Alex, and this is The Ramble. Ladies and gentlemen, out to San Francisco, California, we go. And of course, you know, we're talking to Larry Bubbles Brown. Hi, Larry. Yes, how Alex, it's, you got to get back out here. Yeah, I know you keep saying that, uh, but y- you know, I, I, it's hard to get me out of the house. Okay, <laughs> I know the feeling, but yeah, uh, yeah, and I would love to get out there, and I would love to do a little something. You were suggesting doing something at the Throckmorton. Theater. Yeah, the Throckmorton would love to have you uh, do a, a reunion show with uh, you and Laurie and me and a couple of your comics. So. Yeah, yeah, well, that would be nice. Uh, uh, Lori, I, I, it depends if Lori wants to go out to California, you know, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a large trip and I have to have more than one reason to go out there, you know, uh, but I, I, my reason for going out there is, Hey, I, I, how many years do I have left? I'd like to get back to California at least once. You know? So it's not, uh, not good. So, yeah, and uh, didn't you you spent some of your some of your time growing up in Mill Valley, right? I grew up. I spent uh, a couple of years. I think maybe one year in Mill Valley. My parents had a my my grandparents died, and my father inherited their home in Mill Valley, and uh, so we had a home in Mill Valley. But they didn't like it because it was small. Uh, it was a kind of a weird house. And uh, he really just wanted to sell it. And he had a lot of property up up the hill. And the whole thing was about an acre, which even Jeez. in those days was a lot of property. And um, consequently, uh, he sold it because he wanted to. And they used that money to pay for the house in uh, or pay partially for the house in uh, San Anselmo. And that's pretty much where I grew up uh, in my teens. As a kid, I grew up in North Beach, so, in San Francisco, which is not a beach, by the way. I, I don't even know <laughs> if you can see. It's not north and it's not a beach. It's not a beach, and I don't know if you can see a beach from there. No. All right. So, but, so why do they call it North Beach? Exactly. I mean, wouldn't you think they would name someplace North Beach because it's the beach that's north? I know that if you go up the hill, then down the hill, then you're in the bay. Okay. Uh, So maybe, oh, yeah, that is kind of a North Beach. If you want to call that whole area North Beach, it would be. Anyway, I grew up in... You won't see any sand. Well, who who else lived in uh, Mill Valley for one year? Who else lived in... Now you're asking me trivia questions that uh, are so remote. Who lived in Mill, Mill Valley for one year? I don't know. Robin yeah, Williams. Very famous. You you once interviewed him. I once interviewed him. Huh. Oh no, I thought it might be Robin Williams, but it wasn't, huh? No. And it wasn't Dana Carvey. No. Although Dana still has a house there. Yeah. Uh, but Dana lives in Mill Valley now. He lives in L.A., but he's kept the house here. He kept the house here, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I, uh, who? Uh, John Lennon. What? John Lennon lived in Mill Valley? Came out for a year there. Uh, that I don't remember, because when he came out to California, I thought he was in L.A. Uh, he, we went to L.A. from Mill Valley, but he tried Mill Valley for a year and must have been bored to death, but... Yeah, well, I mean, he uh, he came out uh, he came out here by himself without Yoko. Yoko threw him out of the house here, out of the Dakota, and uh, he wanted to go to the West Coast to be with Harry Nilsson because they were drinking buddies. 
all right? <laughs> and he had, uh, there was this woman that worked for the, uh, for the, for the Lennons, for Yoko, Lenono, as sometimes they call themselves. Um, and uh, her name was May Pang. I knew May quite well. And May, he, she sent May out with John with the explicit instructions that she was to have sex with him and have a relationship with him. Because she felt that if May was doing it, it would be better than if it was some strangers. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. So he and May Pang for about a year out in California had this affair, this relationship. And then he decided to be a good boy and went back home and went to the Dakota and hung out there. And that was his big mistake because then he got shot. So, you know. He had to ride down right in front, right? Right, right in front of the Dakota. You know, that, but he, that's supposed to be isn't that supposed to be an incredible building for some reason? It's yeah. It, it, do you remember Rosemary's Baby? I never saw it. Oh well, that was the building in Rosemary's Baby. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's an old. You know, it's one of the oldest what we call apartment houses in New York. It's older than the one I'm in. Mine actually is pretty much like second or third after the Dakota. Uh, and, and what they were meant to be, they were a new idea. Rather than have a mansion, they would have mansions on top of each other. So a lot of times the whole floor was taken up by one family. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a little different now, but that's a really old building, and it's uh, it's still there. And it is uh, it's a, it, I, a landmark in New York City. So, so he's been... He was forty when he was shot, and now he's been dead. So he's been he's been dead longer than he was alive. Wow, wow, that was kind of. I remember sad. that was. Uh, I heard about that. They came in on uh, announced it on Monday Night Football. <laughs> I um, I had a problem. Uh, I was very big into. You know, I, I knew John and I knew Yoko, and I then moved out to California. I came to. Uh, Camel, K M E L, uh, and uh, at the behest of a friend of mine who was helping to program the station, and uh, I came out and uh, I did a week, and they um, they hired me after a week. And let me put it this way: on Monday they they I went on. They went, "What the fuck is this all about?" <laughs> Tuesday they went. Is he getting better? By Wednesday, they went, he's not bad. By Friday, they they uh, they said, how much you want? And wow. I got the job. Okay. So I moved out to California. And that, that made me move out to California. So now I'm working out in California. And uh, I'm very depressed. I want to go back to New York. I just, you know, uh, I just, uh, I don't know why I was depressed. Uh, my wife w was still living, Ronnie was still living in, in no, Susan was still living in uh, in New York and getting ready to come out. And uh, I decided I didn't want to stay. So I walk into the boss and go, boss, look, I love this station. I've had a good time here. But I just am so homesick for New York, I got to go back. And he said, well, if you got to go back, you got to go back. We'd love to have you stay. Is there anything that could make you stay? And I said, not really. So I walk out of his office and I go home and a couple of days pass. And John Lennon gets shot. And I say to myself, I can't go back to New York because now what it represents to me is death. And wow. it so affected me. That I walked into the boss's office again, and I said, "Boss, uh, can I take back leaving, quitting?" I said, "Because uh, uh, this whole Lennon thing has got me so down that I don't know if I want to go back to New York." And he said, "Fine. By the way, here's another twenty-five thousand dollars a year." Okay. Wow. So I stayed, and. Uh, uh, that was the thing that made me determine to stay in in, in uh, San Francisco was, was the death of John Lennon. So I thank John for getting shot, for giving me a very good <laughs> career, because my career got really good in San Francisco. Um, That's a great story. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was my, that was my uh, 
brush with uh, death. Uh, you know, it, it depressed me a great deal. I'll tell you what happened at the station. I love telling this story because this is the way stations think. They think, oh, John Lennon died. How can we promote this? You know? So they decided they had this big, giant infl- – the station was Camel. It was called the Camel. And they had this big, giant, inflatable camel, a balloon. They take it out someplace, they blow it up, and it would sit there. And it was a good-looking thing. And the the camel in the logo was designed by my cousin's husband, Victor Moscoso. And they actually had a representation of this thing as a giant balloon. So I'm walking past the office, and they're all discussing about They decided they were going to have a memorial for John Lennon out on the Marina Green. Okay? You know where that is. It's near you. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I'm walking by, and they're discussing it, and I, all of a sudden I hear out of the side of my ear, so where, where should we put the camel? And <laughs> I, I, I walked in, I said... I just couldn't help but hear what you were saying, and uh, I'm sorry, but a, a man, a very famous man, a very beloved man, has died, and he's uh, he's dead, and you're trying to discuss where to inflate the camel at a memorial for this man? I said, I know you want to promote the station, but that's all wrong, and they said, well, we got to put it up so somebody knows who's doing it. I went, this is the kind of thing where you don't want to, you don't care where, where, whether anybody knows who's doing it. And they went, well, you know, I said, look, I got a, I got a suggestion. At least if you're going to inflate the camel, just half inflate him so his head is bowed. <laughs> and I walked out. They, they did inflate the camel on the, on the green. They did it. And I, so I didn't show up for the, uh, for the memorial, you know, just couldn't bring myself to. So that that uh, that was the history of John Lennon's death and where I was at the time. And so when was that? December eighth, nineteen eighty. Nineteen eighty. Wow. Yep, that would be just right. I just had gotten there in nineteen eighty. Oh, jeez. You know. I I had just started hanging out at uh, watching comics at that time, and I remember all the comics were so depressed about Lennon being killed. Yeah, oh, well, of course, of course, you'd be depressed about it. You know, it, you know what it was depressing about. I tell you why people were so depressed by it, because it suddenly represented something it had never represented before. It was the end of time. It was literally a a period on a certain era, because you knew that no matter what happened, the Beatles were never getting back together. Yeah. And and the whole thing was people going, you think the Beatles will ever get back together? Will they get back together? You know, always the rumors. They're getting back together. And um, uh, I, 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 when that happened, I just said everybody realized the reason they were really depressed. Yeah, they lost John Lennon. But also they lost their innocence. They lost their childhood. They lost their youth. You know, now it was time to go on and become an, an adult. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. End of an era. How did you feel? I mean, how'd you react to it? I was, yeah, I just remember it was really sad. And, uh, but some people were, I mean, people were crying. And there, there were, I think, memorials in every city, I think. So, so you, know you're, you know you're popular when that happens. Yeah, but, but also, what were they crying? They were crying over the loss of their innocence. Now, right, yeah. You know, because uh, uh, the Beatles were an intrinsic part of our lives up to that point. Uh, every album that came out, we listened to with earphones 20 times the first day we got it. And in those days, they were LPs, so they wore out pretty fast, you know. But... Uh, uh, it was uh, it was it was a quite a quite a change in time. I mean, there have been deaths of other musicians, but I don't think anyone impacted everybody that way. So, so if Lennon had not been killed, you would never have come back here. I would have I would have not stayed. 
Uh, I did come back, but I, I, and I had a job, but I didn't stay. And I can't remember when I first got the job, but it wasn't, it was just like a month earlier, so, you know. But I was. Where was the, uh, where was their station? Because I remember they were huge. They were on uh, down Pier 39. Oh, wow. We weren't on the pier, we were across from Pier 39. You could see the pier out, out the studio window. Okay. Yeah. That was probably the biggest station in San Francisco then. Uh, we were, we weren't number one because KGO always was number one at that point. But as far as music stations went and entertainment-based stations went, yes, we were undis- indisputably number one. Uh, they weren't number one before I got there. They were close to number one, but they weren't necessarily number one. And then I grabbed the mornings and got really good numbers, and uh, that station was the number one station, non-news station in San Francisco. So. And uh, did you start having comics on right away? No, I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, everything I've ever done in this business, I've never done by design. I've let it just happen. You know, I kind of believed in organic broadcasting. You know, so one day, and I'm trying to remember who it was. I think it was Gonzo. I think it was Dr. Gonzo. Came on the show. Uh, was it Gonzo or was it Slayton? I think Gonzo had had done it. I'm trying to remember. It's hard for me to remember. But all I know is that Slayton started coming on the show. And I had him on because he was funny. He wanted to be on because he was a fan of mine in New York. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Used to call into my show in New York. I didn't remember him, but he called into New York. I used to do this trivia thing, and there was this group of kids called the, uh, the, the Yonkers Zappers or something. They gave themselves some kind of name. And, and he was one of them. And they would try to, people would call me up and try and beat me at trivia. And I, I, I was pretty good. That's when I got really good at it. And uh, he was one of those kids that called up. But later years, he came on. He said, I'm a comedian. I'd like to be on your show. He said, I've, I've always wanted to be on your show because uh, I was a fan of yours in New York. And we kind of became friends. And he did the show. And wow. I said, well, do you know any other comics that might want to do the show? Next thing I knew, I was up to my ass in comics. <laughs> you know, Jeremy Kramer came by, and Dr. Gonzo was on the show, and Kevin Pollack was on the show. And Kevin Meany? Kevin Meany was on the show. I mean, we could go on and on and on. All of a sudden, I had this show that nobody else was doing, a show where comics would come on in the morning. And up until that time, there was no show doing that. Nobody, did, nobody ever said, hey, you know, we could mine this whole comic thing and, you know, have these people on. But I, I didn't, uh, I didn't do that. And I did that rather. And the show developed and it became a show with comedians. So that's the history of how that show came to be. That's good. I know. Yeah, I was, that was before I, uh, I was just hanging out. I didn't know, hadn't heard you. I hadn't. Were you on the camel show in the morning? No, I don't think I so. I never did that. No, I no, didn't. You, uh, you came over when I did the quake, I believe. The first time I did your show was January of 83. So that would be the quake. Yeah. Yeah, because I was it's at the quake. On until, Sutter Street. Yeah. I, I was at the quake until, what, 84, 85? 85, and then they kind of went, I think they went under, right? And then... Uh, well, no, they, what they did is some guys came in and they decided they knew better. They knew how to do a better uh, station. So part of the problem was they wanted to... Uh, they wanted me to suddenly play more music. They didn't want all this comedy in the morning and stuff. And, <laughs> and I went, you can't do that. I said, why? I said, look at my contract. It says I have complete creative control over my program. And they looked at the contract, and sure enough, there it was. I have complete creative control over the program. I said, I'm going to do the show the way I want to do the show, uh, and if you don't want me, then let me go and pay me for that. 
you know. So they let me go, and they started paying me. And I was making, I think at that point, what, $125,000, $150,000 a year, something like that. A lot of money then. Yeah, yeah. And so I was out of work for, I don't know, a while. I don't know how long, a couple, uh, quite a few months, when all of a sudden this guy came along from Live 105 named Ed Cramp, and he he came up with this kind of, he was a fan of football. So he came up with a football trade solution. He wanted me. And I couldn't go there because I was under contract to the other station, and I was getting this money like one hundred twenty-five, hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, for just not working. And so he went to them and said, "Look, I will take him off your hands for uh, 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 what was it? He said for for uh, I'll I'll pay sixty percent of his salary. You pay the other forty percent. And if he gets the same ratings or better than the rating he got at." Uh, at at uh, the quake, uh, you're off the hook. And they said, no way, you pay us the 40% no matter what. You, or we'll pay you the 40% no matter what. Uh, we don't think he's going to get those ratings again. <laughs> wow. First book that came out, I beat those ratings. And those guys had to keep paying 40% of my salary for about a year and a half. That's amazing. <laughs> that's that sweet revenge. Yeah, that was very sweet revenge. So anyway, that's uh, that was how I wound up at uh, at uh, the uh, uh, what the the, uh, the live one hundred five. Yeah, and and I'll tell you a story about live one hundred five. Okay, live one hundred five, folks. So you know, you've seen the building before. You've watched television. You've seen them do stories about Elon Musk and Twitter and X and all of that, and they show a building. And that building used to be called the Furniture Mart. And um, on the bottom floor, they had an area that was the studios for Live 105. And I got to tell you, I walked in. I said, "We said, okay, we'll do the deal because we we did all the dealings out of hotel rooms and things like that. Uh, it had to be kept a big secret and whatever." So finally, one day, I finally go down to see the studios. Do you remember those studios in, uh, in the furniture mart? Very tiny, tiny and dilapidated. And uh, I walked in and I went, "What the hell is going on here?" You know, I, and I immediately called my business manager, Gary. I said, get me out of this. I don't want to work here. This place is a dump. Yeah. And he said, if I were you, I'd do it. I said, okay, I'll make the best of a, of a, of a bad thing. And we went in and started using those studios, and they were horrible. They were just, I had a live studio audience, and most of them had to sit outside the studio. You know, I mean, it was just horrible. And um, I, I, but I did the show out of there, and it got very, very popular. And the station made lots and lots of money. And uh, eventually, uh, I, I don't know if it was while I was out of work there, but they moved to bigger and better digs. And they, oh yeah, no, no they while I was still there, they they moved to another building uh, because they were making enough money to do it, and they. They built a studio for me that literally had room for a live studio audience. We mm-hmm. had seats in the studio, and then we had seats in the uh, outside the studio, but we had a big window that opened up, so it then became like one big studio. And uh, uh, but, w- but while I was there, I mean, it was just uh, uh, it was a real adventure. It was a real adventure. Uh, and a strange little place to do a show from. But, you know, sometimes when you're working at a deficit, it sometimes makes you work better, you know. It makes you more inventive because you have to be more right. inventive with your surroundings. Yeah, I remember it was cramped, but we uh, got it was fun, though. <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. That was it, basically. Yeah, I'm looking. we got about a minute left here. Uh, uh, I, I, we went by so fast. Of course, when I'm talking about myself, 
I you know, I, ne- I didn't know much about your history at Camel, so that was very interesting for me. Yeah, well, Camel was a good station, but I, I it felt, was. It was, I, it was huge. I, I felt bad about leaving them, but the money was so good. It was about another fifty thousand dollars a year. That yeah, I could be bought off. You know why not? That's I'm in business for myself, so I had to leave, and I felt bad about that. But you know, you, you get the first paycheck, you stop feeling bad. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, hey, thanks, Bubs. You're gonna do Thank this again. You. I hope you can do this with me next week. I guess we you will. Can. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our good friend Larry Bubbles Brown. In its 10th year, this is GabNet. Talk like you've never heard it before. Well, hello there, everybody. Wait a minute. Let me just get uh, my uh, audio up here. Wait a minute. Where are we? There we go. There's where we want to be. Okay, good. Okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? Are you okay? Are you all all right? Did you have a nice uh, night off from me? We took last night off because uh, there was it was a big night at the Democratic Convention, and I didn't figure we'd have a hell of a lot of people here. And if we did have them here, uh, they would be too, you know. Uh, uh, we just decided it wasn't a night to do it, and it was a better night that uh, you know you watch the convention and see the speeches and see the balloon drop, you know, and things like that, and enjoy yourself. But meanwhile, we got some people waiting here to come on, and uh, we'll put them on. And then if anybody else wants to join us, they certainly can. Uh, let me just do this. There's, uh, let's see here, there's Charlie Wallace, and there's Josh uh, Wheeler, and, uh, well, there's, uh, there's uh, uh, Brian Aneary. Uh, <laughs> he still has to connect his audio. Anyway. It looks like he's outside, though. That's where it looks like he's. Oh, well, wait a minute. There she is. Oh, hey, it's Adrian. Hey, Adrian. Oh, yeah, push the kid out of the way. Yeah, why don't you? <laughs> Jeez, you know. I thought the volume would go on, but it didn't because then it says, oh, do you want your volume on? Oh, I see. Okay, that's the same room you're always doing it from now. Okay, yep. good. Yeah, yeah, you should move your mu- yeah, camera up there a little bit. Yeah, yeah you should. You'll look the opposite of Jeff. You know, so do that. Uh, hello, Jeff. How are you? And hello to Adrian once again. She, oh, poke your head in there, Adrian. Go ahead. We don't mind seeing you. What is that? Oh, you know something? We have one sitting in our refrigerator. Watermelon. Oh no! Oh, that isn't watermelon. It's something else. What? No, it is watermelon. It is watermelon. I don't know how you cut your watermelon. Oh my, how's my? Oh my God, my thing. That's too much work. To do it that way? Yeah. Yeah, if we just slice it, you know, and then eat it and then scoop it out. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> we cut it in half. Oh man, my. I see my Wi-Fi needs to catch up. We cut it in half and then slices across this way and across this way, and then you pull it out. See? Okay, I'll I'll give that a try sometime. But we you get the big full watermelon, right? We get the pre-sliced watermelon. Oh, is that a smaller watermelon that you're using? Yeah. I'd eat that whole watermelon in one sitting. Really? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yes. I I did the other night. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, I guess you're. I guess you were waiting for your uh, Wi-Fi to catch up to you or something. Yeah. Does it take a while after you turn it on for it to kind of get going and get juice, as it were? I think so. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Anyway, I'm a little out of sync tonight. Am I out of sync to you people? Not on no. No. I'm not out of sync. Okay. Fine. Okay. Well, here we are, folks, the day after. I t- took the night off last night, and I think it was the right thing to do, you know. Uh, sure. uh, because, A, I, I would probably not have very many people here, but then again, I don't have very many people here now. Uh, but I wouldn't have very many people last night, and I probably would have had less uh, during uh, mm-hmm. last night's uh, convention. Uh, quite an evening, actually. Yeah. What were you, Let's ask everybody... Uh, 
First, uh, uh, Charlie, what was your favorite part of the evening? Well, of course, I was umpiring until 11 o'clock, so I uh, I did get on in time to see uh, Kamala's, or maybe I'll see in a replay of it. But anyway, I saw Kamala's speech, and then we went back and saw uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren and a bunch of other people and so yeah, Kamala's was my favorite, of course. Yeah, uh, my favorite part of the evening were the two kids telling people how to pronounce her name. I just thought that that was, <laughs> I thought that was adorable. You know, uh, mm-hmm. Josh, what was your favorite part of the evening, or did you watch it? Uh, yeah, I watched. Um, favorite part? You know, they did a good job last night. Uh, Eva Longoria is usually my favorite part. You know. <laughs> Yeah. Nice thing about every four years is we have a Democrat convention and they invite Eva Longoria. So that's fine with me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> Brian, did you watch it at all last night? <laughs> it was all good. I did I enjoyed it. And it was really good. Yep. I want to see if my Wi Fi is caught up. Okay. No, it hasn't yeah. really. Um, <laughs> Yes, yes, watched it. Yeah, I thought it was very, very good. What was I your? I like, I like, I like seeing the Republicans up there speaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was good. That, that was, was really good. That was pretty funny. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. I, it's very, very good. I think a lot of energy in the crowds. You know, so a lot of joy, a lot of joy. Mm-hmm. Basically, yep. that's the way to describe it. How about you, Jeff? What was the favorite part of the evening for well, you? The one thing that I didn't expect, and then there was Sharp, Sharpman, what's his name? Uh, what? Hmm? The uh, the black guy, Sharpie. Oh, Sharpton. Oh. Sharpton. Yeah. Did Did you hear him? His his presentation at the beginning was his typical stuff, as what he would say, with kind of like anybody else there, uh, maybe his own spin. But then he brings up these five guys. Four. I have four. Was it five? Is it five or four that was in that group? It was the uh, the Central I'm Park gonna... Four, I think, wasn't it? No, that's five. Uh, it was a five. Five. five? Okay. Five. Yeah. That's five. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 And of course, for anybody who doesn't know, these these guys were uh, sent to prison for something that they they had nothing to do with it, but. They said At the time, prison. nobody would listen to them. No, and I can't remember how many years. They spent that, about 15 years, I think, in prison. Some crazy thing like that. And finally... By the way, they collected a lot of money Yeah. Oh, after good that. For them. Yeah. So they finally got out. Yeah, but... And they were there, and... Uh, but the, what, we're telling the reason why they were there. They weren't there just because they, you know were innocent of something and spent 15 years in prison, they were there for another reason altogether. That at the time of the Central Park rape or whatever, and the Central Park uh, Five, or was it more than that? I'm trying to think. I, seven seems to... I've re- always heard five. But You've heard five. I've okay. Heard five also. Anyway, wrong. the Central Park Five, uh, Donald Trump took out a full-page ad in the newspaper... I can't remember which newspaper. I think it might have been the New York Times, as saying that these guys should be given the death penalty. The death penalty. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And uh, they basically said, you know, if uh, Donald Trump had had his way, uh, we'd be dead now. <clears throat> you know, and innocent. Yep. A- and uh, uh, so that's why they were there last night. And I think they were. Very, it was very important for them to be there. You know. And also the. The tallest guy, who also spoke very nicely, happens to live and work in Harlem, New York. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But he, he also a, he also does something very important too. He's got a big job. I can't remember what he does exactly, but he he became a very a big person in the community. Yeah. In fact, I think he ran for political office, if I'm not mistaken. I, I didn't know that, but... Yeah. But uh, uh, this was a case in which some woman 
was walking through Central Park or jogging through Central Park, and she was raped, and she claimed it was these guys. And it turns yep. out it, well, they, it wasn't, you know. Her, her memory was a little wrong. And uh, 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 she, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but w when she, that came out, Trump took out this full-page ad saying we should give the, reinstitute the death penalty in order to put these guys <laughs> away. You know. Yeah, I mean, they should have just sent, you know, Briscoe and Green down there. They would have figured it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with the, the, I mean, the detectives from Law and Order would have been right on it, man. <laughs> yes. Uh, but the, uh, I was, when, when they were exonerated, Trump still said they should have been put to death because they probably committed some other crime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did he right. say that, really? Yes, he did. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was listening to the oh, other. No, yes, what? I was, just, I was listening to other speakers. Yeah, I was just listening to other speakers as uh, I was driving home before I watched it on TV. And those, <clears throat> the mothers from uh, from Sandy Hook and from Uvalde, and those were speaking. And the lady from Uvalde had me almost bawling in the car. It was like, you know, hear, hear their stories and stuff like that. It was just, you know. It was, get, it get was, a, it was a night full of very high moments, you know? Yeah. And then her speech was as good a political speech as I've ever heard. Yeah. You know, and you've heard a lot of them, <laughs> right, Josh? Oh, uh, yeah, I've heard a lot. Can you remember any as good as that? I mean, she did really, really well. I mean, as far as convention speeches, I mean, it was great. I, I, I've, I really liked Bill Clinton's acceptance speech in 1992, mm -hmm. you know, because I thought what he did was he brought about a sea change of the way people, you know, voted. I mean, he got people like my parents who had been Reagan, you know, people and things like that to sit around and say, oh, you know, here's a guy from the Democratic Party talking about the economy and family values and all this other, you know, mm -hmm. and he, you know, so I thought that was very important. And she sort of hit on some of that last night, too. And I thought that their theme about the patriotism and all that, I thought a lot of that harkened back to 1992, you know, because in, in 92, you know, from my memory, and then I've, I've seen a speech since then, and just a couple weeks ago, stuff like that, you know, I, I thought there was a lot of stuff in there that when I watched it, I'm like, you know, gosh, if a Democrat would just, if they had just, would just keep talking this way today, they would mm -hmm. have more success, you know, and it seems like they've slowly gotten back to it, which is, which is great. I think that, you know, she's been working back toward that. So his was very good. You know, hers was very good. I mean, I watched the speech. I didn't see anything wrong with it at all. I mean, her delivery was very good and... Mm -hmm. But I thought the substance of it was very good. I mean, for people who want to talk about, like, policies and all, I mean, like like Trump lays out policy or whatever. I mean, let's be real. Elections are about whatever they're about at that time. And this election is not about policy from the Republicans, and it is not about policy from the Democrats. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the leaders don't have policies and there are things that we need to work on. But the fact of the matter is this election is about who... The, the fork in the road and the direction that the country goes next based on who's at the top. That's what the election is. I mean, the election's not really uh, about, uh, I mean, if she has five policies she comes out tomorrow that I disagree with, so be it. Because Donald Trump has no policies that I agree with, yeah. and he's a danger to society. So, I mean, what, you know, it changes nothing for me, you know? If she does a 60 Minutes interview tomorrow and shits herself why she does it, makes no difference to me. I mean, I don't care. I mean, that's it doesn't make any difference. So for that matter, the speech was was very good because she laid out that there is an option for a new way forward for all of the people who are sick and tired of Trump and, and of the nonsense that he brought. You know, I think they've been doing a good job messaging that. Yeah. Now, how do you think? How do you think? I know you see here we have a. What, 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 what's the kind of thing where you have a, a kind of a, a sad feeling the day afterwards because it was just so giddy and wonderful the day before? You have a letdown. Uh, kind of a letdown. 
uh, how do you think now, looking realistically at the future, do you think Kamala is going to do? I think if they keep on the track that they're on, I think that they're going to have a very good chance of winning. Mm-hmm. You know, now what bothers me, and you know, this is what works against them. What's working against them is the the media's love for Trump. Now he can talk about how they don't, but see what what bothers me today is she goes to the convention last night, and I get that they got covered for four days. I, I get it. But every convention gets covered yeah, for 40. Right. Okay? She goes to the convention last night. This is a huge election. Everything's on the line. All the media is running around to tell you it's on the, all that. So what does the nightly news on NBC lead with tonight? Oh, that RFK Jr. is going to drop out of the race and support Trump. And I flip over to CBS night news at 630. And they didn't lead lead with it. They waited about 90 seconds and then they were on it. <laughs> I mean, really? That's the biggest story in America today is that RFK Jr., a fucking guy that if you met him on the street, you would, when you walked away from talking to him, you'd be like, Jesus Christ, fucking, if we ever run into that fucking guy again, like make something up that we got to go do, yeah. you know, yeah. he's a fucking crackhead and I don't want to talk to him. I mean, really? That's the lead fucking story that he's going to drop out and support. I mean, I don't, so it's like, no, no wonder they timed it that way because the media fell for it, you know? And then they go on stage together in this awkward little weird deal that I watched on C-SPAN. And, oh, he's just so smart. And, like, what the fuck is wrong with these two people? I mean, it it makes no sense. But that's what the media talked about for six hours today. I mean, I, I I don't understand why they think that's the biggest story in America, because it's not. A guy that well, was it's not a big story people. because number one, uh, he only had f- less than five percent, right? In the polls, I mean, I'm not and saying it's actually, not a story. Okay, you you understand what I'm saying there? I'm not mm-hmm. saying it's not a story, and I'm saying that when you scroll down three or four inches on the Washington Post, there it is. That's fine, but to lead off the six thirty nightly news on at, at least two of the three networks, because I could only flip around to. The two of them real quick to see what they were what they were doing because when nbc came on i was like you got to be fucking kidding me that's what lester holt's leading with tonight and i flip over to cbs you know 45 seconds into that and they're on it so it's been 90 seconds mm-hmm. since 6 30 and i say to myself i can't believe that nora o'donnell or lester holt who are supposed to be respected journalists and control the nightly news couldn't look at somebody and say if you think i'm fucking reading this script at 6 30 Fuck you. You can find someone else to read it. How's that? You know? And it's yeah. 6 29. So you better make your fucking mind up right now. You can either show a blank chair at 6 30, or I'm not reading this. And if you think I won't do it, I got millions of dollars. You can shove all of it up your ass, and I'll fucking go home and look <laughs> well, at the Well, no, it's not that it shouldn't have been in the news. Okay. Uh, but it certainly wasn't the number one story, I don't think. He and Trump together at a rally today is not the number one story. 12 hours removed from a, con- a, a historic convention and a ho- historic convention speech. I'm sorry, but it's just not. Was that the first story tonight? Uh, I'm up, trying to they remember. Built it up to, oh, hmm? I'm sorry. They built it up like a couple. I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Although I was just saying, and they built it up a couple days before that, too. They said he may, he may, he yeah. may, and then he does, and then he does. So there's two or three days worth of coverage, right? Right. I mean, again, I'm not saying it wasn't a story. I'm saying it's not the lead story. The, the lead story on the 630 Network Nightly News, for as long as I've been alive, is supposed to be the number one story of the entire day, is it not? Yeah. It's the, it's the most important thing happening in the United States. And we States. all know, what the, the most, we all know what the most important story of the day was uh, today, <laughs> is that Beyonce didn't show up last night. I mean, yeah. if they'd, I'd have felt better if they'd have led with that. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, there are probably more people in America who give a fuck about that than they yeah. do about our. I mean, I'm just saying, that's the truth. Yeah. I mean, yeah. my wife yeah. talked for two days non fucking stop about whether or not Taylor Swift was going to show up and make an appearance. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm like, she texts me at like 9 30. She's like, oh, somebody online says Taylor Swift's plane landed in Chicago. And I'm like, yeah. And if I were Taylor Swift, I would have sent it there for maintenance just to fuck with people like you. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, 
so I, that, I mean, that's what I, that's what bothered me about, you know, that, that story today. It was just, like I said, it's not that it's not a story. There's an article about it in the Washington Post, a thousand words long. That's fine. But it's not the top headline of, of, of the website when you go there, which yeah. is okay. how I think it should be represented. It's a story. It's mm-hmm. not the story. Yes, Bree. Bree is in Indonesia, okay, so by the to, way. I, I had to call in because, uh, yeah, the, when it comes to news and what they choose, it depends on where you get your news. That's the that's the important thing. So, and when something happens that is expected, they're not as concerned with it as when something happens that might be somewhat unexpected. So those are, you know, so you, you can go through a whole list of there are news values, that's number one. And then there are different uh, researchers who have different ideas about this. Um, if you look at Shoemaker and Reese, they've defined uh, influences on media content. They, they essentially built that structure. Chomsky and Herman took from that a little bit with their filter model, but it's very easy to explain why an outlet does what they do. Very simple. It's, it's actually uh, not an art. It is a science, essentially. Well, you know, I mean, if I were uh, doing the news, uh, if I were in charge of that newscast, I would not have considered that the number one story okay i i would have considered it maybe 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 number three i can't remember what some of the other stuff was tonight but it certainly wasn't number one and you know i think we've heard pretty much enough about donald trump you know and i just don't know if we want to hear more about donald trump yeah, I mean, I, look, I agree. I'm not, I'm not disputing anything, you know, that how the media makes their decisions and and mm-hmm. breeze, you know, point on and on. I mean, I'll concede all that. I'm just saying, if I were in the chair and I were rich and they wanted me to read that, I'd be like, mm, no, I, I don't really think I don't think yeah, that's it's not that bad. <laughs> that's at the individual level. That's one of the levels. Mm-hmm. And uh, someone who has respect within the outlet. Sometimes they can get things changed, but you know, if you're an intern, obviously you can't. So the the well, individual is one level. It's actually the first level within the media outlet. Yeah, but you have to understand but something. Are, you have to understand well, something about Lester Holt. Lester Holt is a whore, and that's what whores do. Okay, you know, I mean, he he's only out to keep his job and to get the most ratings he can get for the newscast. And I, I don't know, would you consider that? I mean, let's, let's look at it from a purely programming standpoint. Would you consider that the kind of story you want to lead off with for your audience, hoping that's what will make them watch? Or was there other stuff? You know? Mm. So, yes, yes, Jeff. Uh, I'd, I'd look to try to create my another thought. And that is not that there was, what, 20,000 people at that show last night? Mm-hmm. How many people were at home watching? Yeah. The, uh, these the, rating, the ratings for this uh, convention are higher than the ratings for the uh, Republican convention. Yeah, I heard today uh, uh, that it was just short of 27 million people that were watching at the time she gave her speech which was about 7 million more than we're watching Trump. So that's, you yeah. know, 30. That, that's a big thing. I yeah. mean, it's like 30, 25, 30% more well, or whatever. So well, there's your, there's your lead story right there. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, but how, how many votes did Hillary Clinton get versus Trump? She got a lot more votes. I but don't, I don't know. We'd have to go back. In the areas she needed. What? But they didn't come in the in the states where she needed them. Right. Right. So you see, so you yeah. Yeah. I don't know how many of you uh, follow Nate Silver. Uh, but Nate Silver is a guy who used to, you know, do the uh, the odds on football games and you know, mm-hmm. horse races and things like that, and he changed his doing odds, being an odds maker, to political elections, and he. 
uses all the different poles and puts them together and then has an algorithm that lets him figure out where the various people are standing. And in, it's interesting that in the case of the, this, uh, this election right now, he has Kamal Harris winning it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by about 3%, something like that. And, but then again, he also says uh, that more accurate figures are more accurate the closer we get to the election. Because people That's aren't true. really going to make up their minds totally until they get to the last in, couple uh, of weeks. In 2016, Nate Silver uh, and his election model predicted that Hillary Clinton was going to win the U.S. presidential election. Mm -hmm. And the reason it, and why... And, model acknowledged why, why did he say he was wrong? He said, I wasn't wrong. I was right when it came to the total vote. I was vote, just yeah. wrong because I wasn't accounting for the uh, Electoral College. That's it. And that's where you have to go. And well, it's Georgia. Well, he's not, he's not making... I keep saying Georgia. No, it's not Georgia. It's going to be... It's going to be Pennsylvania. It's going to be Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania. It won't be Pennsylvania. Well, it's Pennsylvania because they've got many more uh, uh, electoral votes than. I'm than from Pennsylvania, and I'll tell you, Trump will win Pennsylvania. Thank you. Trump, uh, right now, according to Nate Silver, he's quite a bit behind in in, yeah, in Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's because when Nate Silver does his surveys, he's doing the city folk. The people on the countryside they won't talk to him. No, but he's not. He's not talking to people. He's taking actual other polls that exist and combines them and creates odds. Okay, so it's not. It's not the way you think, uh, uh, Bree. He totally. He totally is using a different model these days. What Didn't that? Obama win Pennsylvania twice? Mm, I, I don't remember what he did. You know, it's too long ago. In recent, it, and I know it's supposed to be recent memory, but it's too long ago. I think, uh, I think Kamala has a good shot, and I think she has a good shot because she has a positive message, and people are sick of negativism in this country. They're sick of the the kind of politics that's just been depressing the hell out of them, and this is not depressing them. What do you think, Josh? Yeah, I think that's the way a lot of people will look at it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I just, but I definitely think they're working against, you know, some of that negativism narrative that they have to overcome for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, just before you guys came on the air, there's a round table on CNN with Abby Phillip, who's supposed to be so great again. And there's some guy on there that was from the 26 Trump campaign saying how he just thought it was atrocious that the very first night of the, the Democratic National Convention, there wasn't an American flag anywhere in the entire building. And then uh, once they realized it, uh, they had to go and suddenly scramble to buy a bunch of American flags. You mean like a couple hundred thousand? Like wait they just minute, fucking drove down to the big lots and said, hey, you think we could have like nine or ten fucking truckloads of little American flags? Come on, man. That's so fake. That's so false. And it's so it's, it's so it's, 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 it, it, like it's that. so jingoistic. And if you want American flags, they had enough of them in LED screens behind everybody, and giant and they, they, American flags. And I, you know, they got yeah, they got beat on the patriotism thing for the first time in years, and they're so sore about it. Well, there, there wasn't even a single American flag there the first night. Oh, oh, really? <laughs> Give me a fucking, you know, CNN should just be like, how about we just time out right here. <laughs> we'll go fucking roll some tape from Monday night, and if we see an American flag, your ass is out of here, and you're never coming back, and your fucking paycheck from CNN that you apparently need to Wait a minute. you can uh, fucking pick uh, up your ass. Hold on a second. Bree, when you're not talking, could you turn your uh, your uh, microphone off? Because there's a lot of people talking in the background. Thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, I... Oh, Did you hear oh, Buttigieg and... Uh... Hmm? What were you going to say about Buttigieg? Pennsylvania both That's times, right. 2008 and 2012. Yeah, I believe so. Democrat can win Pennsylvania. Yeah, I think he won Ohio both times, too. Yeah. Yeah. So. Here, uh, Buttigieg being interviewed with his uh, husband after. Mm -mm. No, I didn't see that. It was really good. Yeah, he talked about, I think, what, what Josh and what you guys talked about before, about that 
they think that getting Trump out of there, he says a lot of, he says, you know, obviously he can't say who, but there's a lot of Republicans who want this whole Trumpism out of their party so they can get yeah. back to normal. Yeah, yeah. Which, yeah. you know, what's interesting, um, I uh, always, uh, the last couple of nights, I have watched the, uh, uh, the proceedings on Fox so that I could be there when they immediately did the follow-up at the end of it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I told you the other night that on, uh, I think it was uh, Wednesday night, when Waltz did his speech, they were waxing poetic about it, the whole panel was just saying how wonderful it was. This is over at Fox. And then last night, I'm watching it, and half the panel was saying how wonderful she was and how terrific she was and how refreshing she was and, you know, that she's going to be a hard person to beat, you know. And two of them felt, you know, had their usual, you know, right-wing asshole complaints. Okay, so now... I'm listening, and they say, oh, on the line, on the phone, we have President Trump. Mm. So I'm going, okay, well, now you just spoiled the whole idea of having a panel. It was maybe 50-50. Here comes Trump. He's going, where was she when all these people were doing this and all these people were doing that? Well, to begin with, she was the vice president, and she couldn't do a goddamn thing, okay? That's for starters. She, you know... She couldn't write a, a thing that told them what to do with the borders and so on. In fact, she and Trump and uh, Biden came up with a plan, presented it to the most conservative of Republicans. They agreed to it. And as they were about to pass it, in comes Trump and says to his Republican buddies, do not pass this. It, I need that issue. OK. And so they didn't. So whose fault was it? But anyway, he comes on immediately, starts going against it. So I turn it off. I just, I, I go, I can't, you know, I, I'm, I'm over-Trumped by this time in my life. Mm -hmm. I wish I had stuck around. You know what happened? Fox cut him off. Oh, beautiful. Fox decided, they, they made a quick excuse. Oh, we got to go now, Mr. President, because he was just rambling. He was right. just in his so, normal, so crazy so he, ramble, and they just said, thank you so much, Mr. President. Goodbye. we got to go. And they, they hung so, up. They hung up on him. So he hangs up from them, and he calls Newsmax, and he talks to them until they can't take it anymore, and they get rid of him. He called back into Fox after that and talked for longer. Oh, really? I don't know if he knew that. Yeah. He, 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 when he got off the phone with them, five minutes later, he was on the air with Newsmax. So he speed dialed them. And they talked to him for a while, and then he called back into Fox. My understanding from it all today was completely uninvited and unwanted. <laughs> but, well, isn't that interesting? But, you know, though? which I mean, he you know he can call it's his right. I'm just saying. Well, these you know. are his best uh, best bets yeah. for publicity, right? And they don't even want him anymore. They're tired of him. You know. Well, you know, I mean, you know, when the horse stops plowing the field, and making you money. Maybe you shoot while well, you come to the end, you, well, know? you, you I don't know. You shoot the horse. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know. If that's what you had the horse mm -hmm. for. I mean, other than that, it's just a pet. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I don't know. I mean, it, it's just but I just the little details of it that that sometimes the media lets go and things. I just don't like I said, when someone wants to go on and CNN and talk about how oh it's so shameful. I didn't see any American flags the first night mm -hmm. and then some of us on our side started to point out how unpatriotic they were, and they had to scramble and run out and buy a bunch of flags for, before Tuesday night. And I'm like, come on, really? Did, did they That's really do that? I really think they just ran down to what, like the flag store Listen, and, and bought for my eight or money, nine truckloads of flags with someone's fucking American Express. For, for my money, card? if you're holding a convention or you're holding a, a thing, yeah, you should have a flag there. One flag. The whole room was full of them. I mean, it was. You know, was, I hate it when they when they put them all across the back. Flag, 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 flag. And I'm saying, you know, I got to tell you, that flag wasn't created as decoration. <laughs> and it certainly doesn't show how patriotic you are because you had seven flags in back of you. I mean, one flag yeah. would be very nice. That makes the statement, you know. We had LED flags all over the place on that set, okay? 
Uh, but, I mean, come on, you know, it doesn't prove anything. It, it's what we call jingoism, you know. Show as many flags as possible, it's jingoistic. Well, it's, just, it's, it's so fake because, like I said, I live in the most Trump county in the United States. Seriously. I mean, I'll pull some numbers up and show you. And I can go stand out the, the, the bay window and look out the back door at the Little League baseball diamond where all those Trump lovers are there every weekend. And that American flag out there is beat all to hell and no light shines on it at night, both of which bother me. It's like I want to go out there and take it down and retire for them properly because they apparently don't have enough respect to do it, but they love America. I mean, but, you know, but these are little stupid things that we're arguing over. That's what I'm saying. Why, why do they got to argue over something? Oh, there were no flags there the first night, but then, you know, we pointed it out and they went and bought a bunch of them. Uh, it, okay. They must have bought every flag within, oh, I don't know, 500 square fucking miles apparently because... Everyone in the whole These room. These were just the little, fl little flags for people to hold. Yeah. Huh. I mean, how many someone of those had to have need? gotten poked in the ass sitting on one of them last night. There were so many yeah. of them. You can't tell me. I mean, it's just, it's the, the, the pettiness and the lies. So that was my point about what you were saying is people are, are they not getting sick and tired of this being the argument yet? Come mm. on. Get over yourself. You know, I mean, really, one, that's what you one, argue one about. flag, one flag is sufficient. Hmm. You know, yeah, more is fine. I but, remember, you know. I remember when one flag was sufficient. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I mean, one or a million, I'm fine with whatever. But I don't think that the number of them dictates how patriotic the party is, or how worthy they are of being elected, or how much you love America. I mean. I don't fly one at my home, and I have no disrespect. You know what I'm saying? It, it doesn't. If I started flying one tomorrow, am I entitled to, you know, tax breaks or something because I'm more patriotic now? I don't know. I mean, it has nothing to do with it. Yeah, yeah. But how many flags like do you said, have? The same, people that, the same people that shake their head up and down at those comments are flying a flag that isn't sufficient. It can barely even hang itself on the pole anymore. It's been that way for two years. Oh, listen, you know, I, I, I used to, I used, I used to do, do I my show from Live 105 in San Francisco, and there was a window, and the window looked out on a, I think it was maybe a paint company or something. Excuse that, Josh. But it oh, was a, a paint things. company okay. uh, of some sort. I can't remember now. And they had this American flag up there, and I think they had some kind of slogan where they said something wonderful about America, you know. And okay. finally, I noticed... This flag had been flying. They don't they never took it down at night, which you're supposed to do, as you know, with the American flag. Or put a light on it. You're yeah, right, you're right. Uh, or you can put a light on it and fly it at night. Okay. Yeah, that's, All right, that's I didn't know cool. that. That's good yeah. to know. But yeah. they never took the thing down, and this flag was so tattered and falling apart and just blowing in the wind and some shards of it would come flying off the flag if the gust was too heavy. Yeah, and, that's what it's and I finally made a joke about that. I said, how patriotic is that? They don't even know how to handle an American flag. It's you got to yeah. take it down at night. It bothers me a little bit when that stuff... I mean, I don't fly one here precisely because, you know, if you do fly it at night, you should have a light on it and all that. And I don't, you know, want the upkeep and all those things. I mean... There's some very nice things you can do, you know, it, when mm -hmm. you when you do that. I mean, you can your congressman can have a flag flown on top of one of the two sides of the Capitol building and you can get in line and, and they will fly a flag and they change it out every day over the House and the Senate chamber. And you can have that sent to your home and, you know, put it up at your home if you're willing to wait a year or so, you know, and, and yeah. they'll tell you the date that it flew over the Capitol building. And all. I mean, there's nice I didn't know like that. that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so. That's what I'm saying is, well, because of the party that I'm a member of, I'm not supposed to know about all that, though. You know what I mean? <laughs> people, this is such a silly yeah. argument. Let me, let me ask you, Bree. If you can you hear me, Bree? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, uh, in Indonesia, are they that way about their flag, or are they just, hey, it's a symbol of our country, and that's it? Yeah. Um, Hmm? It's like anywhere. It depends on the person and the place. But uh, I was just thinking, I was at an event the other day where they played the national anthem, and I couldn't even find a flag around me. But I took my hat off instinctively, but others didn't do that. So mm -hmm. like, I, it's my respect for their country 
even though it's not mine, yeah, I still that's, respect that's, 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 you. Know? It's very good of you. It's very, you know, very honorable of you. Uh, but still, you know, I mean, this whole idea of you've got to stand up, you've got to pl put your hand over your heart, you know, the whole... I mean, come on. These are all this is all jingoistic. I act like an American. Have American values. Have the values of, of goodness to your neighbors and all the things that, for instance, Kamala was talking about last night. That's being an American, not a flag or, you know, your hand over your heart or anything else. What are you going to say, Bree? Well, that's exactly right, Alex. When they were talking about that... I was thinking about the fact that I've had to move, you know, twice while I've been here mm -hmm. simply because I didn't have good neighbors. And, and now, even where I live, I'm saying the neighbors will do things and they just don't think about other people. And I think a lot of that has to do, you know, so when Tim Waltz was talking about that issue, I was like, yeah, you know, I don't get that sense around here. Um, it's, it's definitely a different culture. For example, it is common here, you could go past a, a, let's say you go past a house and it says for rent and it has a number and below the number, it might say Chinese only, or it might say Malays and Indian or no beauty. So that's, you know, they, and they would not bat an eyelid about that here. They would not think that that's discriminatory in any way. They just think that's, that's what these people want. That's what they get. Okay. You know, I don't know that that's being particularly <laughs> racist. It's just that you know, I, I don't know. If you did it you here, you, here. You, if you did it here, you'd get killed for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yes. I mean, uh, yeah. That's interesting. It's interesting. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Oh yeah, uh, Jeff. I I caught. I talked to a young guy uh, yesterday. And I said to him, uh, I said, four years ago, did you vote? And he goes, no. <laughs> and, and I looked at him on that one. And, and I didn't ask him with, with any or questions, okay? But I said to him, I said, are you thinking about doing it this year? And he goes, yes. And, I, and he tells me, I said, Without even asking him, he says to me, well, the first time, I didn't trust, I didn't like either one, mm -hmm. is what he said. Yeah. And he says, but this year, I think I got somebody I want to vote for. And, and I said, good luck. <laughs> I didn't ask him what his question was, you know, who he's going to vote for. Right. But... I think well, we I, all know who he's going to go. Oh, not for Trump. Right, of course, because he he actually said no for Trump before. Yeah, right. He said, I didn't like either of them, and yeah. uh, now I'll vote. Well, okay. Yeah. Don't try. I mean, it's. I'm just trying to uh, do a little assessment of... Well, I, you know, I can't, I uh, uh, you know, people. usually when I look at candidates, I will look at the negatives of a candidate, Okay. And why they would not be appealing to a massive audience or whatever, mm -hmm. okay? In Kamala's case, I see a woman there that I don't think there are very many people who could be objectionable, objective, obje objection, could find her objectionable. Excuse objectionable. Me. Yeah. They could find her objectionable. Uh, because This is well, pretty nice that I'm, I'm telling you how to talk. Yeah, to right. <laughs> She, no, but she, she has a, um, you know, there's not a lot to dislike about her. She's a rather pleasant human being. I mean, all things considered, for a politician, she's very pleasant, you know. Uh, and you don't find that that often, you know. So I, I think that that likability factor is going to go a great long way towards getting her elected. And then you add to that Waltz, who could almost give you a diabetes watching him. You know, I mean, yeah, he's good and sweet and wonderful, you know. I, I'm just waiting for something horrible to come out about well, him, you know. I don't but. see 
I didn't really see any of it, but my wife mentioned it, and I heard a little bit. Now I see something I pulled up on my phone. But, like, were there a lot of people making fun of his son, apparently? I yes, mean, online, yeah. online. But, you know, so what, what, what's the deal with that? I mean, I well, don't I'll tell you what the deal is. Anybody, anything like that happens, there's going to be negative stuff online now. That. That's what online has become. Well, uh, yeah, I would agree with that, yeah. But, you know, I yeah. found it a moment in which I was almost brought to tears by watching this kid. You know, and then he's he's up there, he's crying, and he's mouthing, that's my dad up there. You know? And, yeah, and then I heard about all this. You know, he's, like, he's like Jim Boehner. He's almost got the Jim Boehner blood Yes, yeah, right. I, mean, <laughs> the kid is, is, yeah. I heard about, you know, and then they were saying about, you know, well, some, you know, some things about like his mental. And I'm like, but he, I don't even care. Like, who cares if he has that? And that's what makes him outwardly emotional. Even if he's perfectly normal, whatever normal yeah. is. And you want to that's a kid <laughs> whose father is standing up there to an audience. Of, of what, uh, 75,000? How many people were in that place? 50,000 people? You oh, know? I think it was more than that. That that arena holds more, and they filled the floor. So, I mean, yeah, I don't know. But, all, but all, I mean, all cheering him, okay? Yeah, I've seen, yeah. If, if that were my father, mm -hmm. I'd be crying too. Yeah, but I mean, I've literally seen people act more emotional than mm -hmm. That for some boy band or whatever. I mean, like, what's the, who cares? <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter. I mean, why would you make fun of him for that or, or whatever? I mean, like, I just read this mm -hmm. this article, the headline about Ann Coulter saying something b about him on her Twitter feed or whatever. I mean, like, why? Uh, again, why yeah, are you well, talking whatever about happened, I don't know how old this kid stuff. is, but whatever happened to that old mobster 17. rule that you don't go after family? Well, yeah. you know, I think they said he was 17. Yeah, but I mean, he's 17. So like, but I just don't understand like what part of watching that makes a person and Coulter or anybody else want to go onto the Internet and act like that was bad. Like, I, 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 I mean, are you guys really that gobsmacked that you're starting to get your ass kicked that now this is what you're worried about. You know I mean, like you can't focus now. So clearly it hasn't bothered because the only thing they can find is the number of American flags that may or may have not been present on the first night. And this some 17 year old kid jumping up and down being excited. Are you ready for okay. this? This was on Fox news the other night. Uh, Tim walls. Okay. Is a perhaps a um, uh, um, secret agent or oh, sleeper yeah. agent right. of communist China. Okay. Because yeah. he's been there 30 times. He wow. happened to like China a lot. In fact, so much he was teaching there for a while. You know, he and his wife were married in China. And quite frankly, if it weren't that we are in, bad, in a bad way with China right now, I would love to go back there and spend like, you know, a half a year. It's a wonderful country. It's a beautiful country. Mm -hmm. And by the mm -hmm. way, the people are pretty terrific, you know? So uh, uh, what? why all of a sudden is he a sleeper agent because he went to China a lot? Well, like, again, like I said, because they're starting to get their ass kicked and... You know, I mean, it's no different. All, all of these guys here watch football. And all, it's no different than like you're really supposed to beat this team, and you're there at the game on Sunday, and suddenly it's like I, I cannot believe that we're not beating these these fuckers. All we've talked about all week is how we were going to win, and they're terrible, and we're so much better. I mean, it's just like you just can't handle it. So then you start acting like an idiot. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's just what that's what's happening. Well, what they're what's happening? They're starting what's to lose, what's... and they can't understand it, so they're acting like idiots. What's happened? That's made things. It's the seed change that's happened. Yeah. You know that uh, uh, a month and a half ago, Donald Trump was running against uh, uh, Biden, who, yeah. quite frankly, it looked like he could beat, and they felt he could beat him. And then all of a sudden, they changed the rules. They changed the players. Yeah. And Which, Trump did not handle that, and now he's up against the. All of a sudden, he his his uh, numbers are going down, 
and people aren't paying as much attention to them as they paid attention to them, even though Lester Holt obviously does. Right. Uh, you know, I mean. Well, and it's not just that. They, I mean, look, they were picking out their furniture. You know what I'm saying? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. how they were going to decorate in the White House. And, you know, he's got his Heritage Foundation homeboys who he apparently has never heard of before. You know, they're making their plan. I mean, that's what I'm saying. They're, I mean, you know, they done booked their Super Bowl hotel room. Didn't he have to vet? Didn't he, he have to? Go. Didn't he have to vet the Supreme Court nominees when he was president through the Heritage Foundation? Well, they provided. Yeah, I mean, they guided him along. I mean, they've always tried to influence Republican presidents for that. And, you know, in the American Constitutional Society, the ACS has done the same thing with Democratic presidents and all that. I have no problem with them lobbying. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, as an organization, because that's legal and, you know, fine here in, in America. But, you know, uh, uh, but as I've said for a long time, and we've talked about, he thinks he's using these people. And I think we all know mm, they're using him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as soon as well, he that, not that's case, that, that's him, the case, that's the case, that's the case with, done. with everybody else. I mean, uh, yeah. You think he's using Putin? No, Putin's using right. him. Right. You think that uh, North Korea is uh, is using him? No, they're, he's using them. Or rather, or they, he's using them? No, they're using him. I mean, all you got to do is flatter this guy, and he'll suck yeah. your dick. You know. Well, there yeah, goes I mean, my monetization for tonight. But you know. Well, I ruined that a long time. <laughs> but I, I mean, they. They're using him and have been for a long time, and, and that's what I'm saying is a lot of these folks, their ticket back to a, a, a great administration job and being an important person and an office in the West Wing, and all, I mean, it, you know, starting to slip away a little bit, or at the very least, they're starting to have to fight for it, and, you know, they're not handling it very well, including him. Hey, look, uh, uh, hey that's uh, what I see. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me ask uh, uh, our, our good friend Bree. You aren't using your phone to do this with, or do you have two phones? Um, this is a tablet that I'm viewing and interacting with you, and then I have my phone where I interact with all my friends from the region. Yeah, well, don't do it I right. In, don't do it right in front uh, of the sorry. screen because all we're getting sorry, sorry. is. But I was wondering yeah, yeah. why what you were using. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I want to get a flip phone. I'm looking at the Honor V2 or V3 mm -hmm. um, right now. But the thing is, is it's I like having, because I want to have a phone and then go to a tablet if I'm watching. But I like to have two because they both have separate SIMs. And I can do this. I can communicate with people on one and then, you know, do something else on the others. So normally I'd be watching replays yeah. of uh, the Steelers or the Pirates. <laughs> but since you're on. Anyway, so uh, uh, um, um, Brian, what do you think? Yes. You think you think she's going to win? You're hoping, I guess, that she I, does. But I, you know, I I heard her speech, and I have I've heard a couple of her other speeches, but I think her speech last night was a lot different. Her energy and, and how she spoke and stuff like that. I, I think it was a lot different than the other the other ones, even these last ones with Walls. I think it's. She seemed like a lot different, like very serious. You like her, don't you? you she has a high likability yeah. quotient. Right. It was always, like I said before, it was always, you know, you have you have Trump and then you have, you know, you had Biden. And it was like painful to watch him speak, to see him run everything. Mm -hmm. And then to see her, it's like, wow. It's like now you, there's this breath of fresh wow. air. And I, I think she's on the right yeah. path. And yeah. When she started, though, it was a little bit, it was a little yeah. rough because everybody was clapping so much. And I, I was hoping that somebody backstage remind her of the Howard Dean moment and, and just don't pull a Howard <laughs> Dean, you know, because I just thought I thought that was coming. Well, you see, you won't get that. You won't get a Howard Dean moment because there are microphones miking the audience in, in on the TV show. And the trouble with, with him was... Nobody could hear the audience, so when he was cheering, they maybe were cheering back, but you couldn't hear it. 
And there's yeah. nothing uh, like I learned a long time ago when we were doing shows. We had comedians get up, get up and do their act, and then I went. I listened to it back, and I go, "That doesn't sound right. They don't sound as funny as they were." And mm -hmm. I finally realized yeah. it was because you couldn't hear the audience laughing. So I then told my guys to put a microphone on the audience and crank that up so it's equal with the audio from the yeah. comedian. And all of a sudden, every comedian who went on that show killed. You know? Yep. So, so it's, Well, the best speech of all, we didn't talk about, Alex, AOC. I mean, I'm, I can just watch that on repeat. You know, she was the best. She was really good? By far. I, I didn't, I didn't oh, see her. Better. No. Better than Michelle Obama. Better than anybody, in my opinion. She had the passion. She really had. Well, I, th I do think Michelle Obama was pretty amazing. You know? I agreed with her when, you know, oh, Brock got up and said, uh, uh, Michelle's a hard act to follow. Mm. You know? Uh, I would not want to follow that act. She was terrific. And, um, yeah, she was better than one. You know, I mean, I think uh, everybody was great except uh, the one I couldn't stand. Who do you think I couldn't stand? Clint? Oprah. Uh -huh. I didn't watch that. You know, I mean, when she went, uh, come on, Harris. Now, come on, Oprah. We've had enough of that crap. The only other thing you could have done that would have been bigger than We're that not was, going to back. Say, was to yeah. get out there and point at the audience and go, you get a vote, and you get a vote, and you get a vote. <laughs> I mean, she was pathetic. And people We're not were, going back. Lucky. I didn't have to listen to her. Yeah. You know, um, but I think I think so far everything that for somebody who had to do it at the last minute that Kamala's been doing has been uh, exceptional. I mean, she's hit all the right notes, and you know, the, the, the for them to get that convention together in a matter of a month and turn it around yeah. from being a Biden convention to a Kamala <laughs> Harris convention. Just and and having to change the tone of the whole thing and the speakers who were going to get up there, uh, I think it's it was an amazing job they did. Yeah, know? it's almost like something that you would have to do if you were the vice president and you suddenly became president. You know, yeah, it's a little bit like that. You would have to deal with something unexpected, and could you handle it or not? Well, so I see what's happened as a positive sign in that regard. They've handled it very nicely, I think. You know, I was amazed. I yeah, was if you don't just, agree with their uh, policy or whatever, well, fair enough, you know. But, I mean, you can't deny that they've been successful at their current messaging for the last, you know, several weeks. By comparison, the uh, the Republican convention was almost kind of uninspiring. You know, there was no excitement there. Yeah, the, I did see some stuff today on and that. And she gave a 37-minute speech. His was two hours. Yeah. 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 They kind of had the anti-Republican convention, which is pretty terrific. But anyway, hey, I'm glad you guys got to see it last night, and that's the reason I didn't do a show last night. Uh, but uh, I really enjoyed having you here tonight. And um, there's the theme. I'm sure you can hear it. Uh, I really, uh, uh, you know, I'm glad uh, you were here tonight and we were able to talk about this. Yeah, right, right. The two hand jerk off. Yeah, right, exactly, exactly. Uh, <laughs> well, I want to thank, uh, uh, um, I want to thank Josh for being here. Jeffrey, thank you very much for having joined us. Brian, good having you here. Bree, wonderful having you here from uh, all the way from uh, Indonesia. And Charlie Wallace, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Everybody, give a big wave goodbye, and I'll give a big wave goodbye at you. There they go, folks. That's it. I'll see you all again on Monday. We'll be here on, uh, on uh, what is it, Facebook doing the pop-up show. And then we'll be back again right here next week um, on Wednesday, same time, same station in life. And in the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Night, everybody. Have a nice weekend.
I'm just playing the theme rather long tonight because I got off somewhat early. Again, have a nice weekend, everybody. <laughs>